Corinthians chapter 4, verses 5 through 12. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, Light will shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying around the body of the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For we who are living are always being handed over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Thank you. My friends, it's a delight to be with you in worship this morning. Um, not sure if you've really thought about it or studied it much, but the default setting in our brains is the mind wandering. What should I be worried about? Did I, did I remember to do this thing? Did I turn off the coffee pot? Did I lock the door? What about tomorrow or next week and so on? And, and our mind does that to try to help us solve problems or things that could be a danger to us. And because that's the way our mind works, it tends to take us out of the moment and makes us worry and not fear things well when they're delivered, or not receive the moment we're in. So that's why I ask you now, just take a beat and close your eyes and tell your presence in this place, and to the Holy Spirit, take a few breaths, cleansing breaths, let the worries go, anxiety. Forgive yourself for the thing that you're holding against yourself, and be open to hearing from God. Take a moment. Take a deep breath in. And do your best to empty all the air from your lungs, letting everything go. Trust in God. Now breathe in the breath of God. God, we are here. You have called us to yourself through your Son Christ, through sending your Son to be as us and for us, that we may become like you. And we're thankful. But God, now in this moment, as your body here in the world, we ask that your Holy Spirit fall upon this place to teach us and lead us. God, whether anyone else knows it or not, you and I know that without you, I could be nothing. I pray simply that. If your Holy Spirit be present here and everywhere my voice may be heard, that though these words were put together prayerfully and with great study and thought, that they would be eclipsed by your overall purpose for each and every one of us and for us as a body. That we would know you. That we would sense your presence today. That we would be transformed as we sit under the authority and teaching of your Holy Spirit. Draw us ever deeper into your presence and into the love of Jesus Christ through your spirit now. And it is in Jesus' holy and precious name we pray and God's people stay out loud together. Amen. It wasn't very long ago that I took two of my children to Chastain Park to play on their expensive playground. That's a great playground. When we show up there, I like to let the kids just go. I find a spot to sit down. I often take a journal and I scribble notes about sermons and ideas. Pro tip, if you ever see me at a restaurant or out in the world with a journal, be careful what you say in my presence because I'm out there looking for content for sermons. This time, I put in my earbuds and listen to music and walk around jotting things down. I hadn't seen the kids for about 10, 15 minutes, so I decided to meander to the other side of the playground, see if I could spot them. Sure enough, there they are playing. And as I go over in their dental facility, there's a couple of other parents who recognize me. They send their son to school where my son goes to school, and we've met a couple times before. We start in the normal way. Pleasantry. What's your name again? Remind me. Oh, yeah, that's right. What is it that you told me that you did for a living? I can't recall. And then I found out that we knew each other a little bit better than I remembered. 
their family members sent the kids to Pink Street Christian Church's child town, which was our former daycare, where my kids went. And so we had some overlapping uh, experiences, a little bit more intimacy than we thought. And so our conversations pressed a little further. We started talking about faith a little bit. At some point, I could see that the father was trying to extract his children from the playground. For those of you who had kids, have you ever tried to extract your kids from somewhere they wanted to be? Now, I could see he was having a hard time, so I thought, well, I'll walk with them, with my kids too. They'll follow along, and that would help their kids get into the minivan a little quicker, a little more, or less painfully. As we walked and talked, Ruby, she went off running, and Max, he went off running, and I continued talking. I was, what I thought, in a very engrossing conversation with the man of the couple. He's much taller than me, so he looked down into my eyes, but I noticed that he looked up above my head and began scanning. All the while, his two children using him like a jungle gym. I didn't know what he was looking for, but it made me really kind of nervous, because I thought we were in the middle of a great conversation. I kept chatting, but he's not looking at me. He's doing the uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh thing you do to your own kids when you're busy and they want your attention. I began looking behind me to see where he was looking. And then he goes, oh, there she is. There's Ruby over there. He was worried about where my kids were. I was not. I could tell the way he delivered the line to me that I was supposed to be worried about where my kids were. That a dutiful father, perhaps, in that situation, should have been more vigilant than I was being. So then I began to explain myself to him, and one of my psychological pathologies is that I feel the need to be understood, so I over-explain myself to people. I didn't owe the man anything, but I all of a sudden began explaining myself, right? And so I said, oh, well, yeah, yeah, oh, yes, I, I was going to find them soon enough. Uh, my wife and I, we prescribe, uh, we follow a method of parenting, we like to free range parenting. Which all I mean when I say that is that we try to raise the kids the way we were raised when we grew up, which means that, at least for me, we went and played in the neighborhood. We didn't necessarily have play dates. We just went and played. We went down to the park and we put together teams for baseball and basketball. We knew to be home when the street lights came on. Or, if we really needed to know, Mom gave us the watch and we looked and we were responsible for getting home then. We get lost in the woods for hours upon hours a day and come back home. That means we weren't overly supervised and we had a lot of freedom. Sometimes we got into a little bit of trouble. We skinned our knees. Sometimes we had conflict with our friends and we were all meant and expected to, to work it out. A child psychologist actually suggested that sort of parenting, at least in terms of play, is somewhat very helpful and effective for a lot of uh, developmental issues. But I could tell that when I told the man that our feeling was about being free range parents, I could tell he had a very strong opinion on the matter and he had a judgment. I could see it flash in his eyes. I was looking at a man who had once felt that he would be that same kind of parent. I could imagine that he actually made uh, sweeping declarations to his friends in some bar before he was married and before he had kids, saying something as naive as, whenever I have kids, this is the kind of parents I will be. You've heard people talk like that, right? They have a lot of ideas about parenting until they're parents. Well, the reality for his life is that he had kids and he didn't ascribe to the free range model anymore. And he looked at me and he asked this very quick witty question. He all of a sudden was not focusing elsewhere. He focused on me with his eyes and was, Yeah? How's that working for you? And I knew that I was not supposed to say it's working quite well. I knew I was supposed to give in to his anxieties and say, So it's a problem. Or I can't manage it. And so I began to try to explain myself, again, that pathology, tell everyone how you feel and let them understand. So I said, well, you know, it's okay, you know, it's okay. you know, but during COVID, I tell him, life was hard. He knew it. It was hard for him, too. My wife and I, we worked way too many hours, thankless hours, frankly. 
In fact, you couldn't win anywhere you went. In fact, you were the IT specialist for your children's school. And the teacher, it was just all too much. And so I said, we got together with our group of neighbors and we said to them, hey, you have kids. So we just agree that our kids can roam the neighborhood and play with each other, play in the yards, send them home if they're being a bother. No big deal. Then we all got lost and talked to our kids and they ran around the neighborhood and that's how we communicated with them. And then he told me, he said, well, I guess I could see how that worked if you had a network of people uh, close to you that you could uh, engage in this kind of activity with. I said, yes, like neighbors in a neighborhood. That was lost on me, but still. Parenting's hard. I'm not here to judge, but what I realized is this man might have had the desire to be a free-range parent himself, and I don't know that I'm a good one, but he had fully given in to this helicopter model of parenting. That is to say, very vigilant, always focused on the kids and around the kids to protect them from harm. The harms are often small, like at a playground, like skinning your knee, making sure the kid doesn't fall here or there, or making sure that when they play with other kids that everything's fair. Oh, and then fears and anxieties, they get bigger and bigger as you think, and you pan the camera out. There's no more crime against children in our country today per capita than we're in the 70s, but it still sure feels that way. It feels that way through social media, the 24-hour news cycle, and other things. So, so vigilance is risen. It's gone up. And even though I sound critical of the helicopter style of parenting, I understand it. Don't you? Isn't there something in us that says, I want my kids to have life better than I want it? I mean, isn't that a simple thought? A noble thought. I don't want my kids to have the same problems I endure. And even if you grew up as a person with privilege and with great means, you probably had in your mind some affliction that you wish did not fall upon your kid. Maybe dyslexia, or, or maybe their social awkwardness, or something that you went through that you don't want your kid to go through. You want your kid to have it better than you. There are limits to that, though. There are studies of plenty about billionaires' descendants or those robber barons. You go about two generations in of people who have been given everything you could ever imagine, one generation after another, and before too long, you have people who have had such an easy life and they thoroughly live a life where they don't contribute, they don't make things interesting. Hmm. I'm bringing all this up because I want to tell you a truth. And if you didn't know it, I'm happy to be the pastor to tell you. Life is hard. Life is full of challenges. I will go further and say life is challenge. A life without challenge will produce nothing good. You might even say challenge is part and point, the point and part of life. The real question, I think, for all of us, this is what do we do with the hardships? What do we do with the challenges? And what do we do with the difficulties? Yes, given the truth that life is hard and challenges are ever-present, sometimes Christians tend to, to downslide into a mode of thinking that faith is somehow an antidote for our challenges or our hardships. There are whole theologies, we call them the prosperity gospel, or we dismiss it as health and wealth, where you will hear people proclaim, you have a physical affliction, an emotional affliction, you have debt, you don't have enough money. If you just pray harder, if you just believe more, if you just give $10 more to my ministry, God will give you tenfold more than you can ever ask for or imagine. Sometimes it's as straightforward as that, sometimes it's... it's Painted and made more beautiful. I, I had a friend who was in a, a moral and spiritual crisis of the soul, a dark night of the soul. It was more than spiritual on we it was pain. And he found himself in a community of Christians and, and he was asking for why he couldn't get through it all. And they kept saying to him, There must be something wrong with your spiritual life. You must not be praying enough. You must not be giving it to God enough. He goes, what else can I do? What else can I do for this to be taken away? You need more faith, and if you have more faith, then God will take away your burden. Many of you probably don't subscribe to theology. I don't. It's not the way of our church to teach that, but that doesn't mean that we don't buy into it somewhere. 
faith might be something of an antidote to our hearts, that we might reach out to it almost like an opiate for pain. And I also note that when I hear testimonials about how people have come to a saving faith in Jesus, I, I know how very often it sounds like a romantic comedy in Hollywood. It follows the same trajectory. You know the romantic comedy. They have a story about somebody who's not fulfilled in life. They, they are missing their other. They're missing something. And through a, a sense of comedy of errors, or maybe some darkness, actually. It just depends on if it's a romantic comedy or a romantic drama. But nevertheless, all of those problems along the way are kind of answered by meeting someone. And, and that's the movie. Very rarely do we have a story where we see what life is like or romance is like when dopamine levels come back down to normal and we just live Mondays and Tuesdays together, sorting out bills and irritating one another. That's where romance is. Likewise, in testimonies, you hear people stand up in front of crowds. Let me tell you how bad of a life I lived without Jesus. Let me tell you how, how hard it was. Let me tell you how dark it was. And then I found Jesus, and it's better, and that's great. But why don't we ever hear the testimony of the person who tells me what it means to follow Jesus on a Monday when you don't want to go to work, when you got cut off, cut off on the interstate, when things get boring? Certainly, there needs to be faith there too. What was Saint Paul saying to the church? Well, we reasonably can know this morning because he says it to the church at Corinth. He tells them in no uncertain terms, you've been afflicted. You've been knocked down. You've been persecuted. He, he tells the Christians that life is hard. It's full of challenges. And then he gives them a metaphor. He says, your life is like a jar of flesh. An earthen jar. And they can get caught. And it's good. And if you ever take one of these earthen vessels and you drop it from any significant height, it's better. Christian, have you ever felt that your life has been scattered? Did you get a diagnosis that you didn't see coming? Did you lose someone? Have you been the object of people's dissatisfaction with their own lives? Unfairly so. Have you been criticized and cut a thousand times? Have people said things about you that weren't true? Have people lied about you? Have you ever felt like your life was crushed? It happens to earth and adults. It happens often. Paul reminds the Christians that though they've been afflicted and though they've been crushed, the treasure is in the sun and the thunder. There's a lot in common that we share with the Church of Corinth, and there's a lot that's not common. What is common is that even though we live today in our own society, we still have pain and challenge and difficulty. It falls on every single one of us. Here's the truth I'm happy to tell you today. You will not escape this world alone. You will not escape it without tr trouble and challenge. And your life won't be worth living without them. But it's also very unlike the church at Corinth. You see, Paul is writing to a very cosmopolitan church in the middle of the Roman Empire. Today, if you imagine a church, you might imagine this. A collection of people who are, who are reasonably Christian people in, in a setting that looks terribly Christian. But you have to understand, in this century, and in a place like Corinth, we're talking about the minor of the most minor groups of people. To have claimed Jesus as Lord and not Caesar as Lord would make you not only politically dangerous, it would make you an outcast. That phrase alone could get you thrown in jail. That there's no Lord but Christ if you're a Christian. You were odd because you did not live the way other people lived. And this was a highly pagan society with pagan influences of pagan cults and pagan gods and goddesses from all over the Roman Empire. It was a travel town, a port city. And you would be one of the rarest 
You would be a unique, small, not influential group of people. It's not mainline to be Christian back then. You were one amongst many, and you were not a, a voice of power within society. I tell you that because when I hear that they've been afflicted, and I hear that they've been knocked down, it leads me to that last one. You've been persecuted. My ears hurt. I have a friend named Billy. My wife and I were uh, meeting her for the first time, and uh, I was speaking to her husband across the table, and Sally was speaking to Billy. Billy's from Bulgaria. She's a psychotherapist. Fascinating lady. I was talking to her husband, and I wasn't really listening to the conversation that Colleen was having with Billy, but I heard Billy say, and then the persecution began. And my antenna goes off when I hear that. As an American Christian, I am fascinated with this. Because 99.9% of my experience is not one of persecution, and my guess is that's the case for most of us. We live in a liberal democracy, a pluralistic society, where it's legal for me to practice and believe what I believe. Maybe someone looks down on me for my faith or judge me, but systematically, I haven't been thrown in jail because I claim that Jesus is Lord and not my political leader. I- I've never been threatened with death, nor have I ever died for my faith. In fact, most of my life has been a pretty mainstream thing to, to claim Christ as my Lord. And it has been for you as well. So this persecution business has been very interested. So I asked her to tell more. I said, please, let's hear your story. She tells us that she grew up in Bulgaria, which was communist and atheist at the time. In fact, it was illegal to be a person of belief or profess belief or go to church. So she talks about knowing about God as a philosophical concept that she rejected. But to, to know God is a God that wants a relationship with us, the God that we meet in Scripture, the God that sends the Son, Jesus Christ. That was foreign. She came across that character with her friends reading about their very favorite American pop star, Michael Jackson. Of all people, they were reading about Michael Jackson. And in that book, they heard about this character, God, and they heard about the character, Jesus. And they were absolutely serious. And so they began studying, and he went and found somewhere in their home that was buried in boxes, in an old family Bible. And it's not a Bible that shakes their faith. It's not on a coffee table. It's not a piece of their personal familial piety. It's not even an instruction for their life. No, it, it, it's just a, a genealogical thing they have hidden away. Great, 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 great stolen so his family screams in it. And it's hidden away, not revealing anything about God to anybody until the night she steals it out of the box, takes it in the room, and begins to read the beautiful, high flying theological prose of St. John's Gospel. And as she's reading about Jesus in St. John's Gospel, she has a spiritual slash mystical experience that I cannot describe to you, and I will not try. Maybe I'll bring her here and have her share it with you. So. And as she's telling me about this experience, I'm listening, and then she says, and then the persecution begins. What do you mean? What do you mean the persecution began? She goes, well, it's, it's illegal to be a Christian. And like, no, 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 no. But how did people know? How did people even know? It's not like you had this moment with Jesus in your room, and then there was a scarlet J and C pasted on your shirt, right? I mean, that didn't happen, did it? So, but how does anyone know that you're a Christian? And she looked at me like I was a child and said, Jared, I told everybody. As if it's a shock, as if it was a shock for the minister of the Christian gospel, that her immediate response to having experience with Jesus was that she was going to tell everyone about it. She goes out into the world and begins to tell people about her newfound love of God revealed in Jesus Christ and how she can save by Jesus, how Jesus gave her life meaning and all this. And then she starts talking about how she got in trouble in school for writing papers about Jesus or uh, the philosophical concept of God, about how professors would lie and say they had a romantic relationship for her to get the grades. And it went on and on and on. It was a systematic undoing of her personal reputation. As I hear all that and think about that, it makes me think of this church at Corinth. These people, their lives were threatened, their freedom was threatened, their reputations were threatened. And that's not similar to my experience. Yeah. You know what? Still no pain. 
And I know hardship, and so do you. So St. Paul's words apply to us too. You're in a jar of clay, friend. You can crack, you can fit, and you can shatter. But what's important is it's done. What is up for St. Paul? Let me reread the line. First thing, after telling us in the church back then that they could be afflicted but not destroyed, always carrying the body, in the body, the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be also visible in our body. Friends, though our bodies will suffer to decay inside of us, is to be carried to the death of Jesus wherever we go. What, what does that mean? Well, as Christians, we ought to be really well acquainted with that. When we come to a saving knowledge of Jesus, when we enter into the waters of baptism, we say we are dying to our old self. We are being buried with Jesus on the cross after his cross death. We're being buried with him in the tomb, and he comes out. We come out of the water, it's like coming out of the grave with newness of life. We are saying at the very foundation of our faith that we have to die to our old way. Put the ego down and say yes to a new life defined by Jesus. And it's not just a one-time thing. It's a daily thing where we hand ourselves over, where we die to our desires. We die to what things justify us in our own minds. And we live to the justification that only God provides in Jesus Christ. We live the life that God has paid and paid for, paid, painted and paid for in the blood of Jesus Christ. My friend, when you carry the death of Jesus around in you, that is the treasure in your earthen vessel that will die and it will last. And when you carry that into the world, it's to carry a shape of life that, that, that begins to address the true problems of our world. You see, I don't think we live in a world that is full of persecution. I don't. I think we pass laws that don't adhere to Jesus, and some of us feel threatened about it. I, I think that it's not necessarily popular promote the way of Jesus. And we, we feel threatened about it, but it's not persecution. It's just more challenging. Difficulty to navigate in our lives. We're going to have that. St. Paul reminds us. But where's your treasure? It's carrying the death of Jesus in you. Follow what Paul says. So that. So the life of Jesus may be made visible in your body. So that the life of Jesus may be visible in your body. My friends, when you go into a world that is full of affliction and challenge, and you carry the death of Jesus with you, you will go into the world in a way that says, life, your life, is to be lived in such a way as to give itself for the good of another. You will begin to live in a way that brings the flourishing of everyone you meet. You will begin to live in a way that is not my will be done, but thy will be done for the good of another. You will take enemies, and they will no longer be enemies, but be friends. In the world we live in, where we're obsessed with the idea of the difficulties and challenges and fixing them, or we might be even obsessed with the idea of persecution in a world that doesn't quite look the way we think Jesus wants it to look, we can be tempted to enter into the language of our world, not the language of the gospel. And the language of the world is one of conflict and war. I am so over hearing politicians say this phrase, we're in a fight, we're in a fight, we're in a fight. This is banal, it's boring, it's morally repugnant. Just grow up. Your metaphor for politics it should not be a fight. It should be a garden. What are you cultivating and growing? Follow the scriptures, Christian. Yes. You should get sucked into the language of fighting and enemy. So we become culture warriors, not gospel preachers. Who are about that? One of my favorite theologians is named William Cavanaugh, and he writes that he really wishes and dreams of a church that would go to war. I dream of a church, church that goes to war. And when it's on the battlefield and sees slain bodies, battered cells, not down, plastered into the mud, it comes down to the 
you have a dream of a church that goes to war with armor and enemy, that goes out into the battle of field as a field of the hurt. Oh, oh, friends. I think Paul's right. Life is full of talent. Life is art. Life in the world doesn't make sense when we compare it to the, to the kingdom of God revealed by Jesus Christ, the church. If we remember that it's not about our body, our success, our reputation, but it's about what inside is defined by Jesus. If it's about carrying the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be present to all, if it's about carrying that where we go, then we will go out into the world that is already on fire with war. So we will go as a field hospital to the fallen. And we will be as Jesus, the wounded healers of an otherwise broken place. Careful to define your enemy. It's probably the easiest way to gain community with another person is to have a common enemy, and it's probably the easiest way to have motivation. Find the goal. Christians can easily do that with Satan. But don't give Satan so much power. Satan is not the opposite of God. Satan is not everywhere, behind everything. Don't think Satan is that much power. So we can move our attention to the world. The world is bad. We've got to keep it. No, no, it's not biblical at all. The ways of the world, what people do to be gone and wrong, that's fine. I think if you want to see your challenge today, it is you. You are your biggest hurdle, and I am mine. We have to get over our fear and our anxiety and our desire to control and to lie and to not lie, whether that is physically or mentally or in any other way, what, what we spell out in our own world as demise. We have to realize you're not going to make it. This life that you have is limited. Challenges will follow you. Pain will happen. It's what you do with them that matters. It's how you walk through it, and others. It's how you walk through it all, what you do, and who you take with you. It's about taking Jesus with you in the pain to lighten the burden of another that will make your life worth living and make all of it. We'll help you take meaningful steps on the battlefield where other people war and let you be a wounded dealer yourself. I promise. Remember what Paul says to the church, to the name of everything is wrong. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. This won't take us out yet. We have more to go. Carry the death of Jesus with you so that the life of Jesus may be evident.